Welcome to this INSEAD Knowledge video podcast in which we'll discuss the Société Générale recent rogue trader 5 billion euro loss with uh, INSEAD uh, Professor Craig Smith. Uh, welcome, uh, you're the uh, INSEAD Chair Professor of Ethics and Social Responsibility. Jean Dermin, welcome. You are the INSEAD Professor of uh, Banking and Finance. You're also the Director of the Risk Management in Banking Program at INSEAD. So we're going to have two different viewpoints, uh, one concerning ethics in the marketplace and another concerning banking regulation. Let's start with you, Jean. Uh, what are the lessons to be drawn for banking regulators from your point of view in terms of internal risk management and control? Well, the, the, the main lesson is to understand how a large bank can fall into this trap of such a big loss. I mean, we have to realize that Sogen was one of the world leaders in equity derivative, and that the loss that has happened was in a fairly simple, straightforward business. So I think the first task for regulator it is to understand what is driving the psychology of trader, what is driving the risk management system of banks to miss this accident, and then a separate question is whether or not uh, regulators should do something themselves. Now, what is your viewpoint at this stage with the limited information we have? So my view is that this is very complex, therefore you cannot rely on central banks to do the regulation. We are talking about thousands of different positions, and it is impossible for a central bank to regulate, and therefore the pressure must be put on financial institutions to do a <coughs> proper job themselves. But what about disclosure? Uh, would you argue in favor of more disclosure from banks towards regulatory authorities? I think one way to increase market pressure on banks indeed is to increase disclosure of information. In fact, the very new Basel II capital regulation, which are being put in place right now, are asking Pillar 3 for banks to disclose much more information. Therefore, central banks could force banks to disclose at the end of the year what are called operational losses and these operational losses could include uh, all these trading loss. And finally, what about uh, bonus schemes inside banks which can then incentivize uh, certain uh, traders uh, to behave in certain ways, taking more risk than is authorized? Would you question the use of bonus schemes inside the banking system as uh, uh, something that uh, creates uh, a disturbance in the regulatory context? This issue has been very much discussed recently uh, because, you know, the bonus scheme works as this. If you have a profit, you receive a big bonus. And then if you take a loss, it is the shareholders or the public that will be Or you get loss, fired, perhaps. Or eventually you'll be fired. Uh, uh, personally, I believe that the debate is a little bit overblown because if you talk about senior management, it is already the case in most banks that they are under a so-called deferred bonus system. That is, we, we look basically at the performance of these managers over several years to see whether or not really uh, they create value. Okay, so, so the pressure is on senior management to be very careful. Now, for more junior person, it is extremely difficult to put such in place a system because for a junior person, you cannot promise them a five or 10 year contract. Okay, so I think it's always going to be a fact that the junior person will be evaluated on a short term basis I think that's natural, and therefore, therefore you hope that, that more senior people will have the incentive to regulate properly this junior person. Craig, turning to you now, um, you've recently put out a paper uh, called Why Managers Failed to Do the Right Thing, which looks about at uh, illegal or unethical uh, conduct in businesses. What's your um, take on the Société Générale case from uh, an ethical and managerial point of view? Yeah, I think the, uh, the interesting thing here, Adrian, is why did he do it, right? And what that research uh, suggests is that the law doesn't always adequately inhibit people from engaging in unethical and illegal acts. But the, the, the law does play a part through their moral evaluations. Is, is the act morally the right thing to do or are there reasons why they shouldn't do it? What puzzles me, and, and, and clearly there, is more, uh, there are more facts to come out, is the absence seemingly of any moral constraint on what Jerome Caviel was doing. Why was there no sense that this is wrong? Um, to me, in, in, in some respects, it seems very simple. He was taking 
big bets and big bets with somebody else's money. And you know, when you expose the, 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 the value of the bank, some 50 billion euros, uh, and it's, it, it's not your bank, it's not your money, surely there must be some sense that that was not the right thing to do. All right, but going further on the moral dilemma of what constitutes right and wrong, presumably something that is right at one moment can become wrong the next. Take an example, if, for example, instead of making a huge loss, this rogue trader had made a huge profit for his company, he probably would have been generously rewarded, and therefore the, the actions which he had undertaken would not have been seen as wrong, but rather a great home run for the team. How, how, do, you, how do you resolve this from a moral point of view? Yeah, I think, well, the facts are clearly important here, and it's not necessarily the case that if he had been engaging in unauthorized trades, even if, uh, as we're told, you know, at one point he was up 1.4 billion euros, it's not necessarily the case that the bank would have said, oh, good boy, you know, keep it up, pat him on the back. They would quite likely have come down on him very hard. He'd have probably been fired. He'd violated the, uh, the rules of the bank. What is interesting, though, is the, the suggestion that Curviel has made that he wasn't alone in the sense that everybody, uh, other people were doing similar things. And that is a very stock rationalization that people use in examples of unethical conduct. Everybody's doing it. Uh, now, in this case, we've got to ask, well, were, were they really doing it? Because there's a danger that you have that rationalization and you're making a mistake, that everybody's not doing it. Uh, and of course, even if you have that rationalization, that doesn't make it right. In, in this particular case, uh, as Craig has said, he was clearly violating the rule of the bank because he was not allowed, that was very clear, he was not allowed to take position on the market. Okay, he was only involved in doing arbitrage, so it's very clear that he was violating the rule of the bank. Uh, all traders have commented that even if he had been profitable, and if that had been spotted by the bank, he would have been fired on the spot. And that explains why at the end of December, he introduced all these fake trades, in fact, to hide the profit, because he knew he could not disclose the profit. Now, what is a mystery, and that goes into, I'm sure, into psychology, is why, as he was profitable, as he knew that he could not disclose his big profit, why did he continue to play this game for so long? I mean, this is, this is a mm -hmm. big mystery. Well, precisely, as a professor of ethics, what, what is your answer to that? How does the psychology work in these situations? Well, you've got just huge ambition and seemingly, as the facts come out, from somebody who was very much an outsider within that world, uh, somebody who was not from the elite institutions, the Grand Ecole, uh, but the traditional public universities, and he wanted to, we're speculating here, but wanted to realize his ambitions. He's always said that he wasn't doing it, uh, doing what he did, uh, for himself. He was doing it to make money for the bank, but of course, in making money for the bank, his hope was that he would realize some uh, huge bonus. The, the investigation will obviously ultimately show exactly what happened. We don't know at the time of, of this discussion, but taking a, a, a broader view, uh, what does your research show about managers' knowledge of what's illegal or unethical in general? and whether these messages are properly conveyed inside companies. The research, as I've indicated, suggests that uh, managers ne don't necessarily uh, give as much attention to, to the law as we might, uh, as we might think. Um, and, and perhaps they should be guided by their own sense of what's morally right and wrong because they don't always know a lot about, about the law. So there is uh, it, it, on the one hand, a sense that the, the moral evaluation, ethics, can be, uh, ca can be helpful to guide individuals, um, and especially if they, they lack uh, a detailed knowledge of the law, which, many, which is true for many managers. And on the other hand, you can also say, from a company's point of view, you can go beyond having all these rules and enforcing these rules to also say, 
That's important, but it's the culture of the organization and the values of the organization that also counts. We'll conclude with you, Jean, about the nature of Société Générale. It's true that Société Générale was one of the most recognized players in advanced financial markets and trading. So is it a surprise, or on the contrary, was it inevitable that a prominent bank such as Société Générale that had a strong culture of uh, trading uh, should be the place where something like this happened? And also, the department in which it happened is actually not the most sophisticated uh, area of the bank, so that could also be seen as a surprise. Yeah, so the big surprise is that, uh, as has been said, I mean, Sorgen was like uh, driving the, the Ferrari of the derivative market, and therefore you would have expected them to have the, the most advanced uh, risk management system. But as has been said, I mean, there's always this dilemma that it costs money to put in place a risk control system, and it's not easy to see the tangible benefit. Because if a, does, if a loss does not show up, well, it shows nothing. So, so therefore, therefore, there is this big temptation okay, to reduce on cost. We have to understand that at the time, Sogen was suffering from the subprime credit losses. So, so I can imagine that the pressure on the rest of the bank to perform must have been extremely strong. And therefore, if all these managers are under very, very strong pressure to perform, I'm sure in terms of psychology, I mean, it must create incentives to, to take more risk. Jean Dermine, Craig Smith, thank you both very much for this uh, conversation about the Société Générale Road Trading loss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.